Hey everybody, Sean Sewell and Pat Flynn here on the Engagement.com podcast. Pat is one of my favorite guests to have on, and it's between Hanukkah, last day of Hanukkah, come up to Christmas season, so no better person to have on the show for a holiday special than Pat. Pat, welcome back, my man. Cheers, my friend. Always, always a joy to be on your podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Cheers to you. Thank you for that. And in celebration of Pat, and I know he's a big Megadeth fan, I tracked down this Megadeth Sizon 13, so... You have so I feel like um, I feel like Megadeth has released beer and wine and all this weird stuff. Um, and as big as a Megadeth fan uh, that I am, and I am a big Megadeth fan, I've never tried any of it. So you'll have to let me know how it is. First sip, real good. All right, yeah. Well, I figure Dave Mustaine probably isn't going to put his name on just anything. Right, right. It, this one is a Saison, and so Saisons are really, in my opinion, really easy to drink. I like wheat beers. And this is like, so do I. They're really easy, and it's not too boozy. I think 6.1. So. Yeah, I love, um, if we're talking beer, um, you've had Allagash White probably, right? No, sir, not yet. Yeah, that's a really good, easy drinking. I think it's from Maine. People will have to fact check me on that. I haven't had it in a long time. In a long time. I've been I've been sticking with the local Wisconsin craft brews out here. We got a good beer scene. For really? anybody, who's, if if you need a any reason to come to Wisconsin, I'd recommend coming in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but but we have a very good. So I'll, just to share, I'm drinking. Um, this is this is a Lakefront IPA. They are a Milwaukee, um, um, company, and uh, it's very good beer. Just a very good. This is this is my go to IPA out here. So, wood yeah. indoors. Mm -hmm. Well, I might need to come visit you this summer because um, that musical festival, right? Biggest one. In the summer Fest. Yeah, actually, it, speaking of Megadeth, they were supposed to play there with Ozzy last year, and then, like, things just went crazy. Um, I know, like, Ozzy disappeared. Didn't, like, Ozzy disappear or something? Like, nobody <laughs> could find where he was for, like, a month. Or there was some crazy story with Ozzy, and then Dave Mustaine sadly got diagnosed with cancer. Um, but that would have been one heck of a show. Oh, wow. Um, so for people who don't know, Summerfest is, you know, everyone's got their stereotypical view of what Wisconsin is, and it's not wildly inaccurate, right? Um, cheese heads, cows, this or that. But Wisconsin is actually a very cool state, and there's a lot to do here. And in the summer, there's just a ton of festivals. Milwaukee is known as the city of festivals. So for two weeks, uh, we have what's called Summerfest, and it's just, it's like a mile long strip along Lake Michigan, and it, there's like, I don't know, seven to 10 different stages and they're all different genres. So you got like a bluegrass stage, a rock stage, a rap stage, you name it. And then there's like the big amphitheater and that's where the, like the main headliners will play. Uh, like Tom Petty would be there every year before he passed away. But then yeah, bands like Megadeth, Ozzy. Yeah, and, and that's a mix too. So one night it might be a country feature, another night it might be rock, but there's always like one big headliner. And then all the other stages are like bands that used to be major headliners, but like can't quite cut it anymore. Like like sticks, <laughs> bands like that, you know? Uh huh. So you can see all of them as sort of general admittance, which is cool because you can just walk from stage to stage and it's sponsored by all the beer companies, right? So it's, uh, it's a little bit rowdy, but it's always a good time. And then if you want to pay a little bit extra, you can go see, see the headliners. So I see some really good shows throughout the year. In fact, my favorite show that I ever saw there, so kind of surprisingly, was actually Alice Cooper. Um, that was... That was that was just a really good time. Uh, that guy, uh, just he just puts on a really good show. He does. He's a great musician. He's a great performer. I I was in high school, so that was a long time ago. But uh, yeah, man, Wisconsin is the place to be in summer. You should definitely come out. That is pretty fascinating. I would have never have guessed. Um, you've seen Wayne's World, I'm assuming. Definitely. Yeah. So is Alice Cooper from uh, what is it, uh, Minnesota? He is from the Midwest, right? He's an interesting guy because my understanding is he is, like a lot of these rock musicians, far more sophisticated and intelligent than a lot of people might initially assume. I mean, uh, like he's obviously a very smart marketer. Like he's a, he's a very smart showman, but apparently his personality surprises people. I've heard that he's very philosophically reflective, that he's also like really good at golf. <laughs> apparently apparently like he always does well in the celebrity golf tournament so it's just, it's just kind of these, these funny things where you have like this stage persona but then i guess you know backstage behind the scenes it's just not what people would expect at all what a pleasant surprise mm -hmm. that is awesome um so speaking of wisconsin you guys do not have mountains correct 
We've got a few hills here and there, but you can get to the top of them with a medium-sized ladder. <laughs> well put. Reason I ask, I just want to validate. Um, I, I met, finally, our friend uh, Derek and Ryan Toshner from your state. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, they came out here for the Strong Endurance um, with Pavel event, and I was in charge of recording and micing up Pavel, and Derek and Ryan were just over here answering the questions on the laptops and stuff. And uh, Derek went up to speak about how he trains in Wisconsin for the mountains. And he joked about, you should come visit our mountains. And at first, I, I have not been to Wisconsin, so I'm like, all right, I'll come visit the mountains there. But obviously, it was a joke, just no mountains. Yeah, well, I don't blame you. It's kind of hard to know if you've never been here. Like, maybe there could be mountains in Wisconsin. I have no idea. But yeah, Derek is, um, I mean, I, he's, he's a savage, right? He's just so freakishly strong. It's incredible. Uh, and he's a very serious climber. Um, I've, uh, I did climb with him once at an indoor gym, but um, I, am not, I am not a climber at all. But it was impressive to, to see him at work there. And then Ryan, uh, for what it's worth, you know, his gym is like 10, 15 minutes from my house. So I get to catch up with him. You know, usually every couple months or something, I'll swing down that, but there, train, grab lunch and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. And such, they're such humble and accomplished uh, professionals too. It was very nice to meet them in person. Yeah, good dudes. If you're in the Wisconsin area and you're looking for a place to train, check out TNT Fitness by the Toshers for sure. Absolutely. And when they came out here, it was cool. Uh, they were talking about how they trained or how Derek uh, especially had trained to do the Grand Teton twice, back to back. It, for listeners out there, that's nuts, right? Um, that's, yeah. So he's, he is, like what, what Pat said, a beast. Yeah, like he was like the reason, from what I understand, of like why people didn't want to do the tactical strength challenge anymore because he would just wipe the floor with everybody. <laughs> right? like, was, like he's the reason i would never want to do the tactical strength challenge I'm like i'm never going to beat i'm never going to beat Derek. No. i'm just it's i'm never going to do it right it's just never going to happen yeah, he's just he's, he's just so freakishly strong at pretty much all the lifts yeah like even if i might be able to catch up to him maybe someday in like 100 years in one of the lifts i'm just never going to get him in all of them so thank you thank you Derek. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So dang high, Derek. <laughs> right. He keeps winning the TSC. Um, he, he trains very intelligently. And we, we talked about how he trains and how he trains his students. And again, it's minimalist, like in your ballpark for sure. Basic stuff with the kettlebell, not rocket surgery, just intelligently training, minimum effective dose kind of stuff. It works, works really well. Yes, it certainly does. Yeah, smart guys, good dudes. So that's cool that you got to meet them. Oh, yeah, that was an absolute pleasure. It, uh, I cannot believe this year has been, for me, like I, every other day is like a pinch me kind of day where I'm like, I get to work with, with you. I'm like, hey, pal, let's do a, a chat. And then we're doing it. We get to have beers together. I get to, to meet Derek and Ryan. I get to, I got to work with Pavel. Like last Friday, I'm, I'm done with work. My wife is, let's put a movie in. And I checked my email and it's an email directly from Pavel. He's like, Sean, would you be my guest who attend Plan Strong? Uh, Fabio Zona in the, from in Italy is presenting this 20 hour course. And Pat, I got to tell you, I could barely keep up. Um, it was spreadsheets and pivot tables and just over my head. But um, some very intelligent people out there. So, so how's Pavel doing these days? I'd love to hear about it. Oh, he's great. He's such a kind man and so down to earth. Like I, when I worked with him, you know, very closely, is pretty much he's right there. I'm on the other side of the camera, micing him up, giving him the thumbs up. I crashed the, the Strong Endurance seminar at least twice, once each day. You know, it's like 180 people online, and Dr. Stu McGill's on there, and I'm just messing things up and fixing them, putting out fires, and cameras are freezing. And Pavel is very kind about it. And he's like, this is why I don't like technology. I was like, well, you got me for that, so I'll, I'll jump on the fire. But no, he's just, uh, he's kind, he's direct. Um, he's a very, uh, very positive person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I know you, you pinged me earlier and, um, you, uh, saw my, uh, my morning email, but I've been revisiting some of his older work. His, um, his original, this is such a good Pavel book. I, and I would, in fact, I found it online on Kindle. It was only like three bucks last I checked. So nobody has any excuse not to have this, at least the Kindle version, his original Russian kettlebell challenge. Uh, this was before I entered the kettlebell. So this is like, these are like the early, early days of uh, the RKC. I think it might have been his first book with Dragon Door. It was definitely one of the first. And it is such a good training book. Um, 
he's got a section in there on sort of like the critical principles of uh, of, of kettlebell training. And they're just so good. Like they, they're like it's just like you re, you return to his work, and it just stands the test of time. And it's like, yeah, I guess I knew this, but it's good to be reminded. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very simple. I mean, and a lot of his books are often based around two lifts, <laughs> you know, which is crazy. But like, like your programs, it, simple, effective. Get in, get out, get on with life. Yeah, so what were the um there were the two the two I shared today were um I mean some of them are kind of funny because like his first principle I think is train two to seven days a week. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, that's it's pretty much covers the range of options there, right? <laughs> but but it shows you that you have a range of options, right? You don't have to train seven days a week. Right. You could train two days a week. You could train five days a week, right? So and I think uh, you know that's helpful for for the sort of mentality that people have or things. What's nice about Pavel is he shows that you can have structure without being overly rigid, right? Uh, and that's what, he, that's what he gives you. He gives you a good structure. Uh, he gives you sort of um, guidelines and boundaries where he says, you know, stay within these boundaries. And within these boundaries, you can, you can explore, you can experiment, you can have fun. And as long as you stay in these boundaries, you're going you're gonna to find success. Uh, but don't, don't go beyond these boundaries. So he's, he's really good because I think his programming gives you a certain sense of autonomy and liberty mm-hmm. and ability to experiment. But at the same time, it's restricted enough that you're not going to go off into crazy land, right? And I th- that's like the hallmark of a good coach to me, right? It's like finding the right amount of restrictions and boundaries to put into place so you can get people on the right path, but not being so overly restricted that people almost feel claustrophobic or almost choked in a sense by the prescription. Oh, I love that. That's well put. And um, reading his books in his humor, you know, he likes to, to play up to uh, his heritage, which is fantastic. But also, um, it, it is, like he said, simple. And I tell you, one of my, my true pleasures this year was watching him coach in person. It was, it's like the world's best coach. Um, we, we did probably 20 examples, 20 different individuals uh, through doing some strong endurance programs. And he was able to, like any good coach, like a Brett Jones, like pinpoint the least amount of words, most amount of benefit to make the biggest change. You know, right. it was beautiful to see. Yeah, him and Dan John are the two that I think are just the absolute best at that. Which, by the way, did you know that they're doing um, – uh, and this isn't telling tales outside of school. Dan officially announced this on my podcast. They're doing another version of Easy Strength together. Oh, this is good news. This is great. Indeed, indeed it is. It was breaking on my podcast, the Pat Flynn Show. We were the first to report it, Sean. Let it be known. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, they have, um, you know, Dan, I, I think, reached out to Pavel and and uh, and uh, pitched the idea, and Pavel seemed to be all for it. So um, we don't have a release date yet, but um, it's happening. So, um, which is great news as far as I'm concerned because Easy Strength uh, was – was such a good program and apparently you can't even really find the original book anymore. So it'd be cool to, to have it back in print with updates. Well, exactly with updates, what they've both learned since the first book, my goodness, I'm, I'll pre-order right now. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah, that'll be cool because, you know, as far as uh, mentors and, and people who've inspired me, Dan and Pavel are at the top of the list. So it's like, it's like a super group when those two are, together you know well, of course and you know listeners and viewers out there you probably know us but if you don't i'll retell you every week dan john and pat flynn have a great discussion on pat's podcast and it's it's great because it covers not just fitness it covers a, a nice variety of topics as as pat is super good at doing i don't know of a person or a podcast that covers so much variety as pat does so uh please subscribe to pat's podcast and check it out well thank you that's very kind I mean it. Well, uh, I was checking out one of your podcasts, Dr. Jim, um, a couple of days ago. What a small world. You guys both went through RKC back in the day, right? Right. Isn't that, isn't that nuts, right? So just to give people um, a little background, I get connected with this, with this guy, brilliant guy. His name's Dr. Jim Madden. He's a PhD in philosophy, focuses on philosophy of mind. So he, he like specializes on hard problem of consciousness, what are minds? What is personal identity? Like, this, this is tricky stuff in the world of philosophy. It's notoriously difficult. That's why it's called the hard problem of consciousness, right? 
So I wanted to chat with him because I've read his work. I've been very impressed by it. He's, uh, he's just a really brilliant dude. So I get connected with him just through like other philosophers, right? And then it turns out that this guy is like literally the Jocko Willink of philosophy. I don't know if you saw the video, Sean, but I mean, he's, he's like, he's a jack dude. He's a, he's a jujitsu. He won worlds. He's a jujitsu world champion, um, <laughs> PhD in philosophy and was doing kettlebells before I, uh, probably before I even hit puberty, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> right. So he's doing like kettlebells really early on. And I just discovered this like right before we did the podcast. You could probably hear my excitement on the episode. I'm like, this is crazy because he used to be on the Dragon Door forums. And remember, like, I'm only like inviting this guy on because we kind of swim in, I guess, similar philosophical circles. And I discover that there must have been a time where we were like in the same kettlebell circles as well, but just maybe, I don't know, just for whatever reason, it, it, it totally missed us. So we started geeking out on that. Um, he's an incredibly strong dude. A uh, very serious athlete. He's written a book with tactical barbell called Ageless Athlete. Um, and his training is primarily kettlebells and calisthenics. So, yeah, even though that episode was mostly philosophy focused, he's going to be coming back on actually to chat with, 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 with Dan and I about training next week. I'm, I'm halfway through the episode and I, I heard his excitement about Dan John after you mentioned the easy strength. And uh, I loved hearing the fitness part, especially about how he uses, like you said, kettlebell calisthenics, and I believe uh, steel clubs and a mace. And I right. think there's a mace. Yeah, there's a mace right there. I love the mace. Simple tool. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And he's one of those guys where he's had, you know, 600 pound deadlift and some very impressive lifts with, uh, with barbells, but he, he said he hardly even touches a barbell uh, at all anymore. He's, he's primarily exactly that kettlebells, mace, body weight, done. Oh, I dig it. And uh, he's a joy to talk to or listen to as well. I, um, I really, I could hear in your voice the excitement of like the past had to have crossed a few times through the early days there on Dragon Door. Really fun stuff. Yeah. yeah, it was just one of those like just very odd coincidences. Um, and it was exciting for both of us because he's a, he's a big Dan John fan. I'm like, dude, Dan John's on this podcast that you're on. Yeah. every week and um, you didn't you like you didn't even realize that right it's just a very very sort of funny thing right uh-huh uh, beautiful small world i love mm -hmm. uh that's so cool and um for those of you out there who don't know what a mace is and you guys know what a kettlebell is if you're listening to either uh pat's show or this show you know the kettlebell there's tons of them right there but a mace um i started getting the mace probably three or four years ago got a couple of certifications and this and that but Basically, it's just a metal tube, or it could be a wooden tube as well. You can make your own at home. There's guys on how you can use like a flower pot and pour the concrete in there and just put a dowel, and there you go. You've, you're swinging around a flower pot. But um, it's really great for the shoulders. It's kind of fun too because that weight becomes distal. You can you know put it away from you, and it becomes super challenging. So I, I use a 10 and a 15 pound. Doesn't sound very impressive, right? But 10 or 15 pounds, kind of you know distally and away from your body. Um, it's it's it feels more than it is. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I haven't played with one in a while. We had, we did have a homemade one at the Dragon Gym for a while, and it was a great training tool. You know, you, we would do the halos with it. We would do, yeah, just the, just the push outs with it, uh, carries with it. Yeah. Uh, beat up a big old tire with it. It was fun. Oh Loved yeah. It. Tires. That is fun for sure. It is kind of funny. Like some things. Well, like in any kind of industry, there is some. Uh, polarizing thoughts there's like some people are like all mace flow only right and then there's other people like no it's it's a great tool in the toolkit and i'm, I'm definitely a category two yeah it's one of those odd things you know in, in like everything is so tribalistic when it comes to humans because we can be so tribalistic so like why is anybody surprised right um but the right i, I think you're exactly right john like the right attitude is okay this is a tool um you know, very, very few fitness tools are completely worthless, right? So it's hard for me to take seriously anybody who says that things are like completely worthless. You know, people will like kind of poo poo on machines, but machines serve a lot of different purposes, especially for people who have restrictions or injuries. Machines can be a great tool. They can also be a tra great tool for targeted hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just, it's just a matter of, okay, here's a tool. Let's understand the tool. What is it good at? What is it not good at? And then given my goals, can this be useful in my training program and sometimes the answer will be yes other times the answer will be no and it just depends on the individual absolutely you're right uh, I, i'm guilty also of, of uh, getting kind of st almost stuck in my ways with kettlebell or 
TRX or suspension trainer only. And then recently I had my friend, uh, monkey Dan on, Mon you would like monkey Dan. He was, I love the name monkey Dan. That's <laughs> I want to meet monkey Dan. <laughs> oh, he's a hoot. Uh, when we hang out, we winter camp and then we go climb a mountain and go split board. Anyway, tie a suspension trainer. He has the monkey bars and we would tie it to a tree and do handstand pushups in the blizzard and just a fun guy. And prior to being an inventor and the Kickstarter, uh, you know, success, he was a wildland forest firefighter. Sweet. Yeah, what a badass, right? So uh, we had him on, and he sent over a care package. I had him on twice in the last month, and in between uh, the episodes, he sent over like this big box, and it was elastic band-based products. And I haven't touched elastic bands in like, kill to like 10 years maybe. Mm -hmm. So man, it was nice to try something new, a new tool, and talk to the person who invented it. Why did he invent it? How does he use it? Yeah, everything has a purpose if done correctly. Right. And, uh, you know, the good thing about the kettlebell is it's such a, it's such a multifaceted tool. You know, you can use it for so many different things. Like it's, it's, it's just, I, I, I sometimes call it like the Swiss army knife of functional fitness. Like it covers just a broad range of, yeah, it's just a generalist tool, right? So you can use it for strength. You can use it for hypertrophy. You can use it for conditioning. You can use it for mobility. Is it the best tool for everything in every instance? Probably not. But is it good enough for most people most of the time? Probably, right? Which is why, like you, I return to the kettlebell so often. It's just, it's, it's versatile. It's got enough breadth and depth in a way that m most other tools do not. But there are other tools that are like totally single focused, but are still worth having. I think of like something like an ab wheel. There's not like a, I've seen people get pretty creative with an ab wheel I have, but most of the time it's just like you're just doing ab rollouts and, yeah. and that's it. But it's a really good exercise. And for like 10 bucks to get an ab wheel, I think that's a tool worth having even just for that one purpose, right? Yeah, I'm with you. I, I have a few variations of them and they just work. <laughs> it's, like, it's, just a, it's just a good tool for like one thing uh, and that's fine. <laughs> and that's what you use it for, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. I know uh, Alex is pretty big on those too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, the lesser of the big boys, the little big boy. <laughs> I dig that. Both we'll rub that in his face. Let's throw the big boys. I dig it. Oh, that's good stuff. Well, um, gosh, how are things up there? Um, I last time we talked, we were talking about um, you know, the 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 side effects, I guess, if you will, of like social distancing and stuff. How are restrictions up there for you? Yeah, same here in Wisconsin. You know, thankfully we haven't gone back into any of these uh, what I think are just crazy lockdowns now, especially all the evidence we have against lockdowns not being effective. If anybody's curious, I have a post that has gotten a lot of attention uh, called why lockdowns are not the solution and gyms are not the problem. I have three uh, pretty significant studies showing that lockdowns make no difference in terms of mortality rates with COVID, uh, links to just, yeah, all the empirical analysis you could want on why we should not be locking down and Jim specifically, there was a recent study on Jim showing that the chances of you getting an infection at a gym, if I remember right, were like 0.75 and 100,000 visits or something ridiculously slim like that. So I'm very much on the camp that whatever else we might want to do to, you know, try and, um, and, and battle COVID lockdowns are not the solution and gyms are not the problem. That, that is very clear to me. Right. And we've talked about that before. So thankfully, uh, in Wisconsin, we have not entered uh, any any uh, further lockdowns or restrictions. Things are kind of the, the same as they've been here since I would say August, um, where when some of the current policies went into place. I don't think they're going to change. Um, but you know, unfortunately, like Scientific American came out with a study of uh, uh, what they called the surprising mental health costs of, of, of COVID. And I kind of laugh at it. Like, why is it, why is this surprising? Right. Where you talk about, you know, increased rates of anxiety, depression, deaths of despair because of all the, all the restrictions and isolation and, and what they found also unsurprisingly was that people were worse off uh, to the extent that they, uh, that they watched the media because the media sort of puts them into a, what they found is it puts them into, I have a link to this, to this article in, in that blog post, by the way, the media puts them into a sort of a, uh, a doomsday cycle where it kind of scares them because it scares them. They need to keep watching the media and it scares them more and they keep watching the media. So uh, yeah, not good. <laughs> right. Right. For, for mental health is, is what they find. Um, so I was happy to see that some of these, these, you know, 
uh, costs, some of the collateral damage, if you will, is finally starting to be more acknowledged on the mainstream. It's definitely been acknowledged and, and estimated and, and reported in a lot of the literature. It just isn't breaking into the news cycle for, for whatever reason. So I've tried to make it a point to say we, we shouldn't be so myopic in public policy, uh, which, is, which is, of course, is the, the lesson of a very famous book called Economics in, in One Lesson, right? You can't just focus on trying to solve one problem at the expense of, you know, maybe causing 10 other significant problems in public policy. We have to try and, and take various factors into consideration. Um, so, yeah, here things have been pretty good, thankfully, gratefully. Unfortunately, uh, I have a lot of friends in Pennsylvania still since I moved from there, and they are shutting down again, specifically targeting gyms, mm. uh, which is very sad and very unfortunate because gyms are not the problem. We have no reason to think that gyms are the problem. And people, uh, as, I've, as I've lamented before, and, uh, you know, I want to be clear, like, the lockdowns have not really harmed me at all because I'm, I'm online. Like, if anything else, it sent more people my way. Uh, because they're not able to work out in person. But a lot of my closest friends have gyms. They're suffering. You know, they had to take out on a lot of debt uh, to survive this. I have had a number of people who the dream is dead. It's gone, right? They've had to shut permanently. It's, it's very, very sad, the reality. And uh, there's sort of um, – there's not really a voice for the voiceless here. Um, and none of this is to say that, you know, it's not a tragic situation when anyone dies from any disease at all. Um, but when it, when it comes to public policy, right, um, we have to consider all possible, you know, all the consequences of our actions, right? All the total costs. And that, that sometimes, you know, it takes, you know, it takes a sort of, uh, discipline, if you will, to kind of stand back and try and be objective and see through the fog, uh, see through what I think is a lot of the, uh, manufactured, uh, paranoia, if you will. Um, and that's hard to do, man. That's very hard to do. So I'm, I'm trying to do it, you know, trying to make, you know, take the most reasonable perspective on all of this. But uh, as we know, it's a very difficult situation to be in right now. It is. And I think even prior to COVID, I don't consume media. I mean, I, I don't watch TV. I, I'm not a big fan of it. But my observation growing up, my family literally had two TVs per person. I watch my, my family just absorb everything through TV. And my observation of that observation was it's uh, fear mongering and consumption based, right? So I was never really a fan in the first place. And then running a media company myself, you know, I have the ability to, I don't want to say spin, but to project information. And I think there's an ethical responsibility to, to do that in a very clear way, a very, hopefully unbiased way, and just present you know, I don't say the facts, but present clearly um, uh, your message without twisting because it's super easy. Anybody, especially now with social media, anybody is a, as a media source, right? And especially if information right. or disinformation gets shared, it's just super crappy. <laughs> so it's, it's true. And like you, I don't watch any mainstream media source at all. I try to get my news. I actually have, um, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but it's what I do. I have a sort of curated Twitter feed of people that I consider trusted experts. And, a lot, and these experts often disagree, but they have, in my eyes, um, significant credibility. And, I, I, you know, I like when, when following people disagree because I don't want to put myself in a complete echo chamber. Mm -hmm. So that's where, that's where I'll go. If I want to know what's going on, I go on Twitter, which generally sounds like a terrible idea, but I've curated it to the extent that I try to just find people that I think can really uh, be honest about what's going on in the world. So they kind of can maybe give me the gist of, of what's going on. It's not perfect, but I found that it's, um, it's a lot better than, yeah, just flipping on whatever your, you know, mainstream media source is. Oh, for sure. I can, I can appreciate that. Um, a friend of mine turned me on to this. And again, I, I have a lot of people I work with on both sides. I'm, I'm more, in, more in the middle, maybe more to the left if I have to be totally honest. And I don't even talk about this kind of stuff openly that much. But um, I, I, I love talking with people who I don't always see eye to eye with, like you said, because otherwise you get in that dangerous echo chamber and you just there's no growth. And so right on. My, mm -hmm. my colleagues turned me on to this website. I believe it's called All Sides. And so you have like a right, a, if there's a middle, a middle, and a left, news sources and they has them come next to each other and it's up to you to pick 
which patch you want to go on. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I have to check that out because that definitely fascinates me. The problem is I worry about. I worry, and I'm not saying this is it, but I worry about uh, sources that claim to be unbiased but secretly are. You know, because oh, sure. it's, it's very easy to say you're unbiased, but then curate things in such a way. Right. So, like, I, I almost, I almost more appreciate sources that that um, that will admit what their bias is. Like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, I am, I'm a very conservative person, right? But I'm a, I'm what I call a, a common good conservative, which is quite different than like American Republicanism, if you will. So. If I were to kind of trot out my different positions or beliefs, you'd say you'd probably find that some actually fit more in line with people you would think in the American political spectrum more are left leaning and, and others more with with right leaning. So I don't fit I don't fit well uh, within the sort of American political paradigm. But um, but yeah, I you know I almost appreciate people who w will be open about their bias because bias to me is like we all have it right because we all have our positions. And it's, it's just, but we have to realize it's like a magnet. It's a magnet in the sense that we'll always be sort of inherently attracted toward things that confirm our bias and inherently um, repulsed by things that might challenge our bias. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't, but that doesn't need to stop us, right? We just need to be aware that we have a sort of uh, magnetized um, predisposition, if you will. And so long as you're aware of that magnetized predisposition, uh, aware of it enough. You can still, I think, maintain enough objectivity that you can allow things to challenge your position, even if it might be more difficult. Um, so I don't know. I guess because so many places that have claimed to be unbiased before turned out that they totally won't, weren't, including many of the mainstream media sources, that I almost like prefer things that just lay their, their hand, you know, lay out their hand, so to speak. Because nobody is ever completely unbiased. So whoever's running this website, they've got a bias, right? They definitely do. Now, maybe they're really good. I'm not, I'm not questioning this website. Maybe they are really good at just laying it out as it is. But nobody in life doesn't have – like to just have a position on anything is to, is to put yourself into a, into a certain direction or predisposition. So, um, yeah, those are just some of my initial thoughts on it. But, I, again, not questioning that website because I haven't checked it out. Maybe it's, maybe it's awesome. Maybe it's totally spectacular, and I appreciate what they're trying to do, certainly. But, um, but yeah, there's, yeah, that's, there's some thoughts. <laughs> I, I dig it. And like, you know, I'm like, anytime I read a study, why do they start to study? Who's paying for the study? You know, <laughs> or any kind of, you know, what is the root of all of this? But yeah, and I don't check it out all the time, but when I do, I'm like, that, that's kind of cool. And it's kind of nice too, because oftentimes it, it presents things to me in a way I would never have thought of. Right. And yeah, and like you, you do want to be uh, with, with certain studies, right? Like you do want to be careful because sometimes you'll get the sort of um, ad hominem attacks on studies. Um, like there's some, for example, there's some studies that show that um, having protein shakes, right? Meal replacement shakes um, seems to be quite effective for um, weight loss and satiety control and this or that, which I found is very much true. Uh, but some of these studies have been funded by protein companies. Right. Exactly. Now, now, but does that make them inherently wrong? No, it doesn't make them wrong. Right. It doesn't make them wrong. Right. So you can have a bias and you can fund a study and it can still do good research. So you have to, you have to acknowledge it mm -hmm. and you, you know, you want to be aware of it, but you shouldn't ever just dismiss something completely because of something like that either. Right. Cause it might be, and I think in many cases, at least in what I'm talking about, still a, a very good study and worth taking seriously. Right. Yeah. I dig that. Yeah. That's good. That's good stuff. I dig that. Yeah. Information. I'm, I'm very selective, like you said, about, you know, what I take in, what I listen to. Yeah. People like to talk. <laughs> people think they're experts and stuff. And um, not, not you and I, we, we do our research, but uh, sometimes um, I get around people. I don't, know, I don't know about you. I'm just a guy who says things on the internet. <laughs> don't elevate me too much. <laughs> but no, it's good stuff. I dig it. That's why we're here. Uh, well, fun stuff. Um, this is kind of a fun topic. I, I received a holiday card from, from a student, from a client, and it really made me think. And it said, 2020, good riddance. And I was like, okay, that's one way to look at it. Sure, 2020 has been full of challenges and, you know, a lot of, a lot of pain for a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of things that nobody saw coming, right? 
but also a lot of opportunities, like yeah. a amount of opportunities. And so, you know, some, there's some moments of some days where I'm like kind of down on myself. I'm like, oh, you know, my gyms are closed. Well, my current gym is not closed, but the gyms I've been at for 10, 15 years are closed, right? And the other things that's easy to get into my head about. And then I look back and I'm like, but because of that, I get to do this now. Because of not being able to get out as much and interact, I get to talk to Pat Flynn on, you know, have a beer with him on a podcast. How cool is this, right? Mm -hmm. And so I started to go through some of my accomplishments uh, and like I put them on my, my whiteboard here and I'm just, it blows my mind. Those opportunities probably wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the current situation around the whole world, right? And the cool thing is, this might sound kind of crazy, but we're all going through it at exactly the same time. Has there ever been a, a thing that I know of or you know of, the, the whole world is going through at the same time? Like, right. And so the compassion, just, curiosity, for this is hopefully going to carry forward after things calm down. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of wisdom there, Sean. I really do. Um, you know, you often hear of people saying 2020 is the worst year of all time. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. Give me a break. Right. I mean, like, aside from like virtually every other year in human history, especially before, before modern society, right? Like, this isn't the Black Death. This isn't World War II. Um, like, there has been far darker periods in human history. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, this has been a challenging year. I'm not denying that. This has been a year with a lot of grievances, a lot of obstacles, a lot of pain. I'm not, I'm not downplaying all that. But the worst year in human history – not even close, not even close. Um, and I think, but it, but even if it was, right, what are you going to do about it, right? Like, what are you going to do? Like, you can't, like, you know, as much as we want to change the entire world, we can't. So what do we do? We, we start with where we are and we do what we can, right? And this is where, like, the stoic wisdom is, is, is good, right? So, or, or the classic, you know, there's a classic sort of serenity prayer, which is, you know, it's sort of cliche, but I think there's a lot of wisdom in it. And it's to kind of what you talk about, Sean, like a, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like, God, you know, uh, grant me the courage to change the things I can, um, uh, the, the, the acceptance to change the things I can't, the wisdom to know the difference, or something like that, right? It's something like that. I'm totally butchering it. And, like, how brilliant that is, right? How, because wh what else are you going to do? What, what else could you possibly do aside from try to, have the, to try to have the wisdom to know the things that you can affect and the things you can't affect? And to hope that you can have the courage and strength to work on the stuff you can work on. And if, you, and if there's things beyond your control, to not sit and ruminate it, ruminate on it and worry about it, right? Um, it. No, I love that. He, he, there's an episode I had, I had Brett Jones on. Uh, Brett Jones, obviously, just so much respect for him. And he talks about uh, perception of control. Like, nothing's really in control. <laughs> Let's accept that, right? But the little things we can perceivably control, buy your shoes, make your bed, wake up on time, these things, you know, uh, own it. And like, so something changed for you this year, not you or me, but like something changed in just the listener of the viewer's life. It's okay to be a little sad about it, sure, but own it. What, what can you do to adapt? What can you do to change? Maybe a new opportunity presents itself, you know? Um, and it's not as like easy as I'm making it sound, but maybe it is, you know? Maybe it is. Maybe the, it gives you perspective that you didn't know or you, you just needed a little bit of a push in that direction. Yeah, I think it's as simple as that. Maybe not as easy, yeah. um, but it, it's exactly what you're talking about. Like, I can't, I can't make the virus go away. I can't decide who my political leaders are. Uh, I, can't, I can't do any of that, right? But I can make sure that my wife and kids know that I love them. Mm -hmm. I can do my best to take care of my family, uh, to make – sure that my friends like you show Sean know that I how much I appreciate you and I can write content and I can do podcasts and I can I can uh, clean my room and I can I can work out and I can I can try and uh, you know do good in my in my local community and um, I think that that's yeah I think that that's that's it right um, and sometimes we get so distracted by like the stuff we can't change that we neglect the stuff that we can have an influence on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a disaster. Right. And I, that's something I got to remind myself of frequently is, you know, sometimes I, I like, and like anybody else, I'm superhuman. Right. So I get stressed out about the goings on in the world. Oh, yeah. um, 
but then I, but then I always want to like punch myself on the head when I let that stress like negatively affect you know how I talk to my wife or my kids or something like because that's the stuff I can control and it does really make a difference so yeah I don't want to make it seem like I'm totally above it like we're all affected by the stresses of the world in general but that serenity prayer man like just return to that again and again it's such a because what else would you got? What else you got, right? <laughs> There's just no other option, right? Aside, just stew in dis- despair and, and depression, and that's no way to live, right? Mm-hmm. No, it's not. And, and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really double down on this topic because I feel like I've been, uh, I don't know the right word, blessed or grateful for the opportunities. This is going to sound really morbid, but hear me out. So uh, you and I have talked about this. Uh, listeners and viewers, no stranger to the fact that I've been the caretaker for each member of my family before they've passed. And so as horrible and as painful as that is or sounds, it has given me uh, context and strength to handle pretty much anything that's come my way. And it's mostly based on what Pat just mentioned about just accepting. I can't control whether or not my sister has brain cancer or goes blind. I can't control whether my, my parents get pancreatic cancer. I can't control any of that, but I can't control showing up and just hanging out with them and showing them love. And, you know, those are things you can't control. And so my wife and I sometimes will we'll sit over dinner and we'll talk about some things and what we're grateful for. It sounds kind of morbid or weird, but we're like, we're like decades ahead in some aspects because a lot of people don't experience that for a long, long time. So now we have, right. you know, sound kind of selfish, but now we have in our toolkit some crazy strength tools to handle stuff. So when this, this year, you know, the unique events happen, we're kind of like, all right, Let's band together. Let's just let's just get this done. You, you know, it's we've talked about this before, and it's it sounds morbid, but it's it's one of those things. It's true, but you might not realize that it's true until you experience it. How suffering can be a blessing in disguise. Like, yeah. yeah, cancer sounds like a terrible thing, but having family members that have had cancer and died from cancer, in those moments, you find that a lot of things break down that otherwise wouldn't have broken down. Your ego, your superficiality your resistance to, to, I don't know about you, Sean, but I'm just a very resistant person to, to often telling people how much I care about them. Mm-hmm. And that resistance gets broken down, right? Um, and things happen, things that, that are very beautiful and good and, and, and permanent in like a real way. Um, and then you also, like you said, like once you go through that, it gives you a perspective um, it gives you a sort of shield, if you will, where you can just you can handle <laughs> other things that just aren't, you know, serious end of life, people dying situations. And, you know, it's a cliche, but there are blessings in disguise in that. Right. Yeah. And I hope that that, that hit somebody or some people at the right time, because um, it, it really is. It can be a blessing or a silver lining. Uh, some there's something to be gained in that pain and that suffering for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, as long as the person can, can kind of hear that uh, and accept it, it's, it'll, um, it can empower them for sure. Like I know um, last Christmas we get done with my, our family and I, I get home and I, I've been talking about that. I think on a Facebook post, like I, I try and put up that kind of stuff this time of year, especially because I know a lot of people might be going through their first holidays without a loved one. And I want them to know it's, it will get better and also be a resource. And so on Christmas last year, I took a phone call from a person I've never met and talked for like a couple hours about it. And he had just lost his father, uh, maybe that, that morning or the day before. But anyways, it's, there are people out there that have been through and that are, are happy to be a support. Um, yeah, so you're not alone. Everybody's going through. The same yeah, what a beautiful thing, Sean. Like, like really, like you know, all the the tragedy and the trauma aside, the fact that um, you were able to be on the phone for that person. Yeah, it meant the world to me. Yeah. I know that that they got a release because it's not easy to talk about with some people because a lot of people haven't probably been through something like that before, and so yeah, it, and it's nice too because he doesn't know me. And I don't know him, so they, they can it can be more open, you know. Absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that offer still stands for anybody out there. I'm, you know how to get a hold of me. But yeah, I, I really love how open you are to talk about, the, you know, the ups and downs and the resilience uh, and the tools we gain in the process of doing so. You know, it's one of those things I was thinking about the other day is like, um, you know, our society is, is I, don't, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain, but like, 
you know, I've, I've been through a lot and I don't talk about it. I know you've been through a lot. Um, I just assume that everybody's been through a lot. <laughs> like that's my default. Like you just don't, you just don't know. You just don't know what people have dealt with. Like you just, you just don't. But like the more, the more I've lived, the more I've talked to people and got to know people on a deep level. It's like, damn, you have dealt with a lot. And I'm really sorry about that. So I'm just very hesitant these days, right? To assume otherwise about, about anybody. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Very healthy approach. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it was Eric Frohart, a retired Navy SEAL, who's been through a lot, or it was Brett Jones, or maybe both. They both mentioned, um, we're all going through battles. You know, we're all going through own battles. And they had much better, beautiful way of saying it. But some are public and some are not public. So, yeah, I th I, like you said, just kind of try to, I don't want to assume, but try and be curious to what another person has been through or is going through currently before reacting. Um, we'll do you both favors. Indeed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for a pretty good example, kind of a funny example. I, I go camping year round. Last night I was going to go camping. What well, went to go camping, opened my first beer. The sun is just about to set and it's almost the shortest day of the year. It's, with, it's with, within one week of being the shortest day of the year. So it's like 345 and the sun's gone behind the mountains. And it's all of five degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm, I got my park on. I'm good to go. And I look at my dogs and they're, they're really cold. I'm like, you know what? It's not fair to them. And I look at the weather and the wind chill is actually negative 15. I'm like, all right, that is too cold for the dogs. So I pack up, I dump the rest of the beer out, head home. And um, I've never in my, in my life experienced such aggressive, bad driving. And it's like a blizzard out. It's snowing sideways. From what I could tell, there was no moon. We have no street lights on our highways here in Colorado for some reason. And people are just driving like really dangerously. And so I was trying to what we just talked about, try and keep that in mind and like, okay, this person just cut me off at 60 miles an hour in a blizzard. Maybe they have a wife who's about to give birth and they need to get to the hospital. I don't know. <laughs> like just try and be curious and give them their space. You know, yeah, I'll give you another example, right? In fitness. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll be quick to make judgments on, on people's, uh, you know, appearances. Right. Um, but I've known a lot of people who, if um, people saw them at first glance, might assume that that person is lazy because they appear overweight. They're not disciplined, right? And that, um, you know, all these different things. But what they don't know is that person just lost 100 pounds, right? <laughs> right? That they're actually, that they've actually been working very hard. And, and, and that, uh, um, and these stories are not uncommon, right? So, Again, like I, I, there's a middle ground to be struck because there's there's one extreme where people there's just like healthy at any size movement out there, which I think is just absolutely ridiculous. But there's a kernel of truth in it, and the kernel of truth is is that there's often more to the story than the other extreme wants to ad admit, right? And the other extreme is that like unless you have like six pack abs or something like that, your life doesn't have value, right? So like there's there's these two extremes. That are both vicious, right? And like Aristotle would say, we got to find that golden, that golden mean. Like, yes, we need to take care of our bodies, our health matters, our weight can play a significant role in that. Um, but maybe we want to sit down and talk with somebody and get to know where they're coming from before we start, you know, committing ourselves to rash judgments about that person. Uh, and I'll tell you, like, I, I have a lot of people in in, in my strong on group um, that have just had tremendous tremendous journeys you know that were like 200 pounds overweight and they're 100 pounds down so you know compared to somebody who uh like me is just you know a, what we would call a, a dispositional skinny bastard right uh they might be working harder than me and have more discipline in their life right now than even i do right um just something to keep in mind right you just don't always, you just don't you just you you know you don't always know as much as you think you know and first impressions, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's beautiful. And mm -hmm. your group is it's a great example of a, of a community, a strong, healthy community. And I, I think, and we talked about this a few times, I think on a previous podcast, that is one of the big takeaways that I've learned this year is how important community is. It's, uh, yeah, because obviously during this year, we can't just go do something and see people's faces and hug them and do all the, the I'm a big hugger. I like to hug and, you know, all the interaction violate all the social distancing. Yeah. yeah I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
them up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a challenge on that part for me, but um, yeah, community. Super important. Well, it's a challenge for everybody because our nature is not, we're not just rational animals as Aristotle would say, but rational, social, dependent, political animals, right? We are social by nature. And if you start to, if you start to frustrate some significant aspect of who we are, you're going to see deleterious outcomes to that. And that's exactly, that's exactly what we're seeing, right? <laughs> right? Um, I, I shouldn't be laughing at it because it's so serious, but it's it like, I laughed at when, again, it, it said the surprising cost. Uh, it's not surprising. We're social animals, right? If you start to choke off our social lives, our other, our human to human interaction, which is so necessary to our thriving and flourishing, of course, we're going to see negative outcomes from that. That's not surprising at all. So you're right. You know, we do what we can. Um, but, you know, the social aspect of our lives can never can never be um, anything but critical and essential. So we got to we got to get it somehow. You know, maybe maybe it's Zoom meetings, maybe it's online communities just making do where we can. I think that nothing can beat obviously the face to face. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you're you're spot on. Yeah, I mean, and I think you're right that people have come to recognize and appreciate that so much more. Um, sometimes I mean, you know, again another cliche, sometimes you you don't know what you got until it's gone, right? Sometimes you don't know how important something is until it's it's taken away from you. And I think we're starting to to recognize that a lot in a lot of ways right now. Mhm. Mm you know what? I'll be the first to admit, I didn't think I it as much as I do because <laughs> I'm pretty damn introverted and I spend a lot of my time alone in the wilderness, do you know? And now, um, yeah, I'll be the first to admit, I, I, I need it as much as the next person. Oh, it's, it's funny. My wife is the same way. She's a huge introvert. So, like, I knew that this was a serious problem when even my wife was craving, like, the social gatherings. I'm like, you? Yeah. Scrooge? kidding my wife my wife is a beautiful wonderful person right but she's like but we, but we clash because i'm super extroverted like i just i love being out around people all the time she's super introverted so it's kind of like a funny point of tension for us so i knew it was an issue when even she was starting to like, like oh yeah there's a know, feel it mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to gauge on that for sure yeah right. I found myself talking to neighbors for half an hour or the clerk at the store just like tell me more about your life <laughs> you know? why not yeah that's default in the Midwest. I mean, if you go into a grocery store, just always a lot, like 15, 20 extra minutes of random conversations. Oh, yeah. And I, I enjoy it so much. And uh, I know we wear a mask, but I can tell when the squint is going on, there's a nice genuine smile going on. It's always good. Well, yeah, speaking of virtual meetings, I, my wife has hosted every Thursday since the first or second week of March a virtual happy hour. Not one has been missed. So like today would be here at a four thirty, about half an hour. Um, it's actually grown. We're going to do one, uh, a glog party and, um, glog. I don't know if you guys out there know what glog is. I barely know what it is. Uh, from my understanding it is a Swedish mold, nasty ass wine that you usually put vodka in it to just drink it. And, um, so my friend Ricard is going to host it and I'm very excited to see all the, all the fantastic faces on there. And, um, have you ever had glog? I have not, like I said, I've uh, I've heard of it, um, but I've never experienced it. I'm interested. I'm very interested. I, it, if my understanding, it's pretty damn nasty. So the vodka <laughs> like smooth it out, <laughs> and uh, that makes it more efficient. And then that you catch a buzz, and then obviously, like you can drink some pretty nasty stuff if you get a few in you. You're like, oh, that, that's not too bad. I can tolerate that. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. What's the um. Yeah, I, I do like, well, yeah, I, well, port isn't nasty. I do like port. I can't drink too much of it because it's port. Um, mold wine, the spice wines, I, I enjoy them around this time of year. You know, it's, it, it's, it's like sour beer. Like, I can do a little bit of it. Like, a little bit of sour beer is fine. I can't sit and, like, just drink sour beer, though, you know? No, it, it, it makes you appreciate because it's such a unique flavor. You're like, oh, do I like this? Do I not like I don't know. You just, yeah. Yeah, I went to a couple sour beer tastings, and by like the second one, I was over it. You know. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that. Whereas on the other hand, this Megadeth Saison is way too easy to drink. My goodness, it's from this brewery called Unibrow. Have you heard of it? Mm, like, where are they at? <laughs> They're up in Canada, and they make my my favorite beer in the world. And if you've never had it, I would love. I don't know how to ship it to you, but I'd love for you to try it. 
It's called La Fin de Monde, End of the World. So that's uh, a To Le Monde is a Megadeth song, first off. So that's interesting. To All the World. Um, wow. Kind of coincidental. Um, interesting. So that's funny. Megadeth paired up with the brewery that makes your favorite beer of all time. Yes. La Fin de Monde comes in a four pack. It's 9% alcohol. It's a Belgian Tripel or Triple, however you say it. Mm-hmm. I've been drinking it since I had a fake ID. So, <laughs> what's okay? I am sold. I will. I will track that down. Yeah. Uh, those are some of my favorite beers. Um, I can't drink too many of them because no, punch. And I, make- I, I, I just. I just can't. <laughs> I never have been. Um, there's a. I don't know if you've had Victory beer. You oh, know Victory. Beer? That's funny. Yeah, Golden Monkey. Right. So Golden Monkey. Uh, I used to live ten minutes from Victory in PA. That's where I used to live, right? So Victory was like my backdoor hangout, um, their original location. And the first time I had Golden Monkey um, was pretty early when I first moved to PA. And I didn't know what it was. And I thought it it tasted not like it is. So I had a lot of them. And it was a bad night. (laughs) It was was a bad night. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a that is a potent and delicious beer. So if anybody hasn't had Victory's Golden Monkey, that's one of their flagships. It's a really good beer. It's delicious, dangerously delicious. I have a horror story involving Golden Monkey and 250 stitches. Um, I won't put. You sh- wouldn't be the first. <laughs> uh, uh, four or five years ago, I had consumed probably two too many, maybe five, maybe six. I think it comes in a six pack, mm-hmm. Golden Monkeys, and I was like drunkenly looking for some food and I heated up a pizza or chicken or something on a, on a porcelain dinner plate we got for a wedding and it comes out of the microwave and I go to put it down and I, and I put it down with too much force and it shatters and I continue full with the motion going through and it just sliced my leg, barely missing the femoral artery, four, four layers deep, 250 stitches. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking about this last night. I'm not going to show pictures. It's very gruesome. But, um, you know, with our toolkit of, like, handling unique situations, I put on, like, showman. I'm like, we go to the hospital, and I'm telling pirate jokes and dad jokes and, like, entertaining the ERs and the EMTs and stuff. And they're, they're coming in like, you would never believe this guy's awake. He's conscious. He's splayed open like a filet. And so there's much worse situations going on in the ER. But when they were not attending to a horrible situation, they would come over and talk to me. How do you feel? I'm like, I'm, I'm fine, you know. I'm five, six beers in. Actually, I've got the golden monkey in me. Yeah. I can't feel barely anything. But uh, yeah, golden monkey. Stop at four. Otherwise, you might get a... Stick. That's crazy. So for I, I don't know if they still have this policy in place, but the last time I was at Victory, they had a policy where you could, you could only order two, which is interesting because you could order more than two of their other beers, which were as high, if not higher, in alcohol percentage. But golden monkey has such a reputation of people... Because it's such easy drinking. So easy. Right? So, yeah, I don't think that's a bad policy. I think that's a good policy. <laughs> I only really have that in place. But, yeah, you could you could only order – last I remember, two, they would only serve you two Golden Monkeys if you go into Victory <laughs> because it's got such a reputation of of bad stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It tastes so good and it's so damn potent. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, that's always so fun talking about this. Well, speaking, I, I bragged about or boasted. I'm not too sure the right words. I'm just grateful for the things I got to do in 2020, the podcast with you, with uh, Dan John, and, and working with Pavel. What are some of your favorite things about 2020 that you've accomplished? Oh, boy. Um, what has this year What has this year been? Um, it's been a lot of, you know, promotion and marketing. So I had my, you know, my newest book come out technically last year, but as books – um, go, you know, the promotion always goes on after, you know, after the book comes out. Mm -hmm. So how to be better at almost everything. It's been a, it's been a busy year of interviews and podcasts. Um, I recently shared just a a sort of roundup of, of a lot of the media appearances I've done this year, included the engagement podcast on there, of course. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. I enjoy that because I just like talking with people. So it's something I'm always, I'm always happy to do. Um, in terms of publishing, I haven't done, uh, I, I am, I am possibly starting a new book right now. It's in the pitch. It's in the pitch phase. So we'll see. I, I kind of promised myself I wouldn't do another book. And then here I am thinking about one. 
Uh, this year has been mostly academic publishing. So I have about three journal articles that are about done that I hope to submit. So that's been the writing that I've done this year, uh, kind of a more technical aspects of the areas of philosophy I'm interested in, which means that like 13 people will ever read them. Um, but that was, that was kind of my goal this year. I wanted to do more academic publishing. Uh, so yeah, I got another book in the works. It's been a good, um, it's been a good year for my fitness routine, all things considered. Um, just training at home. I got, got to work out with my, my son a bunch, really introduce him to, he's seven years old. So, you know, this year really just kind of get him into the whole physical culture scene. Um, business wise, pretty much just going steady. I don't know, Sean. Yeah, those are, I don't really have like anything crazy monumental to report. I don't. A lot of it's been a few projects here and there, a lot of maintenance, but yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good, just good, just, just a lot of good. <laughs> it really has been. I really cannot complain personally about a lot of, a lot of this year. No major family catastrophes, a lot of, a lot of good family stuff, all things considered, and just a you know, couple of fun projects I've been working on here and there you know that's that's great that sounds like a very good year doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's 2020 or whatever year it was. that's a that's a good quality year there's been worse years for pat flynn many worse years um yes. so yeah yeah uh good writing year very productive writing year even though i didn't publish a lot of stuff this year i wrote a lot of stuff this year mm -hmm. if that makes sense no it does and and like you uh, i really find a, a great joy in writing you know because sometimes we can't do this I'd like to do like, I think I talked about on last podcast, like all the places I would like to go were on fire. <laughs> They're going to go there and like, can't do a lot of the things you, we would like to do in person, but you can write, you can create, um, you can study. I, you know, yeah, I'm with you on that. I've really enjoyed the writing this year for sure. And yeah. So yes, I, but now I got a lot. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I, I was just going to add to, um, uh, out of nowhere, really gain new writers on incurement and they found it to be, I could probably say, therapeutic to write about things that they care about. It's it's been beautiful to see for sure. It's a it's a great release. Writing is. I think I think writing and music, both of them, are just great outlets. It's like physical exercise, right? Just any type of expressive creative outlet, I think, is so necessary for us. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm now sitting on a bunch of stuff. So I guess you know, heading into 2021. Um, no. What year is it? It's 2020. Yeah, 2020. <laughs> Where am I? What world am I on? Um, yeah, it will be mostly just getting the stuff I've written out there. That'll be, that'll be the next, the next phase. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. Looking forward to that. Yeah, next year is less than two weeks away. That's crazy to think about. Yes, it is. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not adequately. I don't know. I don't know what, know what it would mean to me. I'm not adequately prepared because I'm not. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with New Year's like resolutions, but it isn't just it isn't really anything I do. You know, mm -hmm. no, ditto. I, I don't either. I actually look at more that this is I'm not a, a pagan. For, well, maybe I am pagan. I don't know. I like nature a lot. Um, but uh, the 21st of December is the winter solstice. So for me, I'm like, oh great, we actually from here on out start getting more daylight. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Perfect. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, yeah. Same here. So what will change for me January 1st? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, in January, <laughs> it's a new year. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, I know I like, you know, I think it's important that people set like, you know, big goals, yearly goals, but uh, it's also important to set the micro goals, you know, the macro, the meso, the micro. So, um, again, not against resolutions because, you know, even though, you know, you have the, you know, the typical thing of people starting a resolution and banding in it you know, two weeks later, you also have people to set a resolution and it changed your lives. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to discourage that. I've seen a lot of success come from people who decide this is it. I'm going all in. So anybody who wants to make an attempt at something at any point, I'm going to, I'm going to support you. That's great. Yeah. I dig that. For sure. it, some people need that, that construct. The first of January, we're going to do this more power to you for sure. Yeah. Now look, if you've done that for the past 10 years, and it hasn't done anything, then we need to have a, a conversation. Then we need to sure. maybe work on something else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, reevaluate for sure. Oh, this is great. Um, I, I appreciate your time, Pat. Is there anything else you want to cover? 
Anything you want? Yeah, no, man. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is I'm loving the new ACDC album. Have you gotten that yet? Uh, I have not. There's the SG. I know you're an SG and an ACDC fan. Um, so what is it about that you appreciate so dang much? Hey, look at this. There she is, Sean. I don't know if people are watching or listening, but yeah, the uh, the old Gibson here is playing this today. Um, what do I love about ACDC? Well, I grew up on ACDC, so mm-hmm. it's a lot of nostalgia. Um, ACDC was the band that uh, got me into music. Uh, my earliest memories are driving around. My mom was a big ACDC fan, right? So she would just blare ACDC in the car. So like, you know, as my like my earliest memories involved ACDC. So just um, there's that. Um, you know, people will complain because they say like ACDC always sounds the same, right? And I have to I have to remind them like ACDC doesn't come in kinds. They only come in degrees. And that's what's beautiful, right? That's what's beautiful about ACDC, right? Um, that's not that is not a criticism to my mind. That is exactly why I love ACDC, right? Um, they're also they're also um i should be their 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 pr agent at this point right they also have just a beautiful simplicity about them right so from a musical perspective especially you know when it comes to some of their truly truly phenomenal albums which are all of them they teach you uh how much um you can do with just the basics right how much and how much the space between notes matters as much as the notes themselves, right? There's just a number of their riffs where it's like, okay, I know all those chords. I played those chords before, but you put them in a certain order, right? And you put a different spacing between them. And now you're famous because of it, right? I mean, just think of like back in black highway to hell, right? Everybody, I don't even have to sing it because everybody knows the riffs, right? right now, yeah. And, and Angus's solo. So like, okay, yeah, a lot of pentatonic, a lot of blues, but like I I learn his solos and they're not like crazy technically difficult, but it's like I don't know how to make this better. I don't, right? <laughs> right? I could only make this worse. So somehow you're just finding where to put the notes in like the perfect exact place. And that has always it's one of those things where like when I first started getting like really I think serious and technical about music i kind of like thought a little bit less of acdc because they weren't like dream theater but now i think as i've gotten older and more mature i just think higher of acdc um because they just they just got it they just they just have something about them um something about their their dynamic as a whole um that will always appeal to me and i just appreciate more and more and there is a technical precision like malcolm god rest him uh died a few years ago um is just an incredible rhythm player um angus has got a mean vibrato he's a great showman um so yeah i could go on and on uh, all day sean so i don't want to <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a huge fanboy. so if you get me going i might not stop no that's fantastic and i can i can uh, make this summarization too that it very much makes sense because the the way you approach uh fitness as well is very simple and effective right like not a whole lot of there's more complicated things out there you can do a one-legged blindfolded thing on a bow suit but who, what do that's a dream theater of fitness right so what the the simplicity works the spacing works it just it's effective it's effective that's it so new album power up it's awesome it's one of those things that it's definitely an album the more you listen to it the more you're going to fall in love with it so if people haven't checked it out go do so I'll check it out. I think it released on a Friday the 13th. Is that right? Whatever else you want to say about 2020, the fact that we got a new ACDC album unexpectedly. Cause we like, we, so I saw them a few years ago mm-hmm. when Axl Rose was stepping in. Cause Brian like lost his hearing, which is a crazy story. I won't get into. So mm-hmm. most people thought ACDC was done. And now like bang out of nowhere, this new album. So it was like, for us, for us fans, it, it it meant something, you know? Wow. All right. Well, let's table that for next time. So I'm going to pick your brain about that. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. That is really fascinating. Oh, this is fun, Pat. I, I love this. We got to do this happy hour ones more often. I'm, I'm on my Yeah, st- man. Always a blast. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we've kept the listeners interest. I've had fun. So I have too. 
Well, hey, uh, Pat, if I don't see you before the end of the new year, cheers to you and your family, man. Merry Christmas and happy new year to you. And thank you. Cheers for- to you. Merry Christmas to all. Happy new year to all and looking forward to future conversations. Awesome, Pat. And for you listeners out there, I'll put links on how you can find out more about Pat Flynn. Just a great human being. Um, and thank you for always checking out our stuff and uh, much love to you and your families. Thank you.